Okay, so the first question is a model-based question. The Broad Basin has a Kiops model in place. Will the outputs from Kiop model correlate to the SWAM outputs? That, that, that's something we've talked quite a bit about. Uh, the, the Broad River is not unique in that sense. There are a lot of basins in the state that have other models, and we will make an effort to uh, test them to, to see if they're generally producing the same type of output. I, I'll add a caveat, though, that the, the uh, input that goes into the two models is fairly different. Uh, the Kiops model in the Broad River uh, accepts unimpaired flows only to the extent, really, that that uh, uh, impoundment has affected the flows. What what that model really seeks to do is test the availability of water uh, for hydropower uh, usage, and what is available has already been impaired by other uses. And so the process of unimpairing the flows is fairly different uh, in, in the two, two venues. That said, I think we will compare the output from the two and make sure that the trends in the hydrology are the same. We'll certainly compare, as John said earlier, the operations of the model. We'll look at the operations in the Kiops model and translate a lot of that information directly into ours and make sure that the reservoirs are be behaving in the, in the same way. Do you have anything to add? Okay, next question. When will the model be available to evaluate proposed water uses, proposed minimum flows, etc.? We did show a couple schedules, uh, little bar charts, and we do need to update those a little bit. Our schedule slipped slightly. Uh, if you look closely, you would have seen that the broad should be finishing up in September uh, or thereabouts. Um, we're just starting now with the unimpaired flows for the broad and actually taking the framework and turning it into a model. Um, right now we're targeting near the end of the year to have the, the calibrated um, broad model. So right now that's the goal. Uh, sometimes in, sometime after the end of the year it may be made available. So we're still talking to DHEC and DNR regarding offering training. Uh, first we need to train DNR and DHEC staff on its use um, and then we'll open up training to, to other users. Do you want to add to that? Yeah, yeah I think it will be a, a, a little while because um, we need to get all the models done. So, you know, that puts it toward the end of next year. We, we need to get the training, everything set. Um, you know, then there'll be um, scenarios run to do the planning. So I think it'll be a little while. So it's still, you know, into 2016 before the tool itself is developed and, and ready to implement. And then we have to work on implementing. Okay, next question. Why was the Cherokee Falls Reservoir apparently not included in the model? This is between Gaston Shoals and 99 Islands. You said the Cherokee Falls, correct? Cherokee, Cherokee Falls, Falls Reservoir. Um, yeah, there is a, a small hydropower operation on Cherokee Falls, and I, I noticed yesterday that we don't have that included in there. Um, that's something we may want to consider including. My understanding is it's a pure run of the river facility, and it's a, it's a smaller reservoir. Um, so we do need to look and decide if that merits inclusion. Good catch. Okay, next question. How will you develop water demands for the next 50 years? There are several methodologies that are uh, uh, accepted in the uh, in the water business, and we're trying to decide exactly which one to use. We've had some discussions with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to help us with that, and they're going to present to us uh, several alternatives. So we don't actually have the set methodology yet, but it is something we're working on, and uh, we intend to probably have that uh, nailed down within the next six months. Okay, just remember to turn it on each time you answer a question. Thanks. Um, because the Broad River Basin actually begins in North Carolina, how will you determine what enters the basin from North Carolina? Great question. We've had a lot of discussions about this internally too. Uh, we'll do two things with the Broad River, and, and the Broad River, again, Broad River is not unique here. Uh, 
one, one of the things we will do is run the model that was developed for the North Carolina Broad River uh, section of the basin and identify what the flows are as outputs of that model at the state line, and we use those as inputs. And we'll do that twice. We'll do that with the unimpaired flows from North Carolina so that we can see what the total natural condition of, is of, of the flow throughout the entire river. But for planning purposes, that may not be as useful as looking at the impaired flows uh, that enter South Carolina, because that's what this state has to work with. And so we'll run the North Carolina model, which is in OASIS, two ways. We'll get the unimpaired flows as boundary conditions at the state line for comparative purposes, but for planning purposes, we'll also have available the impaired flows coming into South Carolina, because that's what this state would have some jurisdiction over. So we'll do it both ways. Okay, what if any previously created data or models will be used or referenced to calibrate, validate the SWAM model results? As I mentioned, we'll certainly use the, uh, the KEOPS model of, of the Broad River to compare against our, our uh, predictions in the SWAM model. We'll also use, really rely heavily on USGS records. That's what we're really trying to, to reproduce, as well as historic uh, elevations in reservoirs. Now, some of those historic elevations are not necessarily going to be measured elevations. They'll be elevations that come out of the Kiops model, for example. So we'll, we'll be heavily relying on that uh, for reservoir comparisons, and uh, certainly, again, comparing the two models and, and seeing if there are any discrepancies that need to be explained. Okay. What is the methodology used to identify drought periods and for evaporation? If, if I understand the first part of the question correctly, it's uh, the identification of drought periods to trigger some, uh, some action or some change in, in management. Uh, such as conservation measures or changes in minimum flows that, that might be required. Some of that will be programmed into the reservoir elements in the object, in the model itself, based on flow conditions elsewhere. A lot of the reservoirs will have rules uh, in which releases are conditional on uh, flow conditions elsewhere in the basin. That can be added directly. Uh, we're still talking internally about how we, would, we, we might consider uh, you know, drought indices, uh, th those are composite indices of drought conditions uh, county by county in this state, and we're working on developing some ideas as to how, how that kind of thing can be used. Um, but really the, the functionality of the model for droughts uh, is that the demand can be entered as anything that you'd like to test. And so you can test the functionality of different conservation measures by simply reducing demand uh, over certain periods of time uh, that are known to have been historic droughts or over the entire time uh, and see how the model responds to that. So a lot of different ways to test to test that. Th there was another part of that question. Uh, it was about uh, methodology for evaporation. evaporation. Um, currently we are using, uh, for those of you who may be familiar with it, the Hargreaves method of estimating evaporation from the surface of reservoirs. Uh, we're not concerned so much with evapotranspiration from land surfaces because we're starting uh, our data input with USGS records, with water that's already made it into the stream. So the evaporation is key uh, in, in this model, in these, this series of models, as it relates to evaporation from reservoir surfaces. And we'll be using the, uh, the Hargreaves method for that, which is a, a measure of uh, air temperature uh, and, and uh, I think it's time of year uh, to estimate evaporation. The model itself, when you're using it for predictive purposes, can accept a lot of different types of evaporative assumptions. We can input evaporation uh, as, as direct explicit input based on known patterns, or we can have the model do some calculations for us. Okay, this next question has a yes or no answer, but I'm going to ask you to give a little more detail than yes or no. Uh, can the model be located on the cloud for multiple users? Yes, um, that is the intent. Um, um, we've talked to DHEC about different ways to get the model out there, including just distributing it. We decided probably the, the safest 
best way to do it is to make it available on a cloud so it's not going to be on DHEC servers. They don't have to worry about maintaining it and troubleshooting. Um, it'd be available up on a designated server uh, cloud that uh, is always available. So how it would probably work is that you would send an email to DNR or DHEC and you'd say, hey, I'd like to access a certain model. Um, they would give you kind of a username and a login, and then you would get a link to where the model is, you would log in, and then it's available up on the cloud. So when you go to use it up there, it would be like uh, very similar to what's done in North Carolina, where it basically sets up its own little folder for you. You can do your own runs there. You can save your own output there. You can download that output to your local machine if you want to. Uh, you wouldn't be able to download the model itself, but you can uh, keep everything in your own little spot up on this cloud or on this server um, and have it there for when you want to go back to it. And tweak a run or do a new run. Okay, will the, uh, or can the s scope of the model grow to include runoff and water quality? No. <laughs> yeah, the, um, I think Kirk described that earlier that, you know, the, each model really has its own strengths and weaknesses and abilities and, um, you know, when we look at water quality, we have specific models at DHEC to, to do that and to evaluate, um, for example, NPDES discharges. We do not anticipate this model uh, taking its place. We would still have our own processes for um, those other evaluations. And yes, I think the questions are moving into the agency realm here. I think we're, we're kind of finished with the model questions. Um, will the state water plan that was mentioned previously have stakeholder comment involvement at various junctions along the way? Absolutely, that's uh, one of the keys to the Hill process. As I mentioned, we're going to uh, set up basin advisory councils in each basin. Hopefully, you'll all participate, and uh, there'll be uh, multiple meetings uh, with stakeholders in the basin advisory councils. So, short answer is yes, absolutely. Okay. Is there a Broad River drought contingency plan? Uh, well, we have, South, we have the South Carolina Drought Response Act, which, uh, you know, covers the entire state. Uh, I don't think there's a basin-wide drought contingency plan in place at this point. I'm sure the, um, you know, the folks that control the water and impoundments and reservoirs have low inflow protocols and that kind of thing. But... Uh, that's probably something that's going to come out of this water planning process, recommendations for just that. Are there or will there be required in-stream flow requirements and how were these developed? Well, David can probably address this too, but uh, yes, there um, are minimum uh, in-stream flow requirements that are part of the law. Um, it's based on seasonal variation, 20%, uh, uh, 30%, 40% at different times of the year. So yes, there are. Okay. Uh, Duke Energy has developed KIOPS model and North Carolina uses OASIS for the broad. Why move to the SWAM model? Well, uh, those of you who know about state procurement, it went through the state procurement process and uh, CDM Smith uh, was the winning bid and they used the SWAM model. And, uh, you know, we think it's uh, appropriate for our purposes. So uh, it's, it was really the result of the procurement process. We didn't just pick it. Okay. At what point do you interface or seek concurrence from the EPA? I'll let David handle it. <laughs> yeah, EPA, um, and, and this is broader than, um, than South Carolina, EPA has relatively little to do with state uh, water resource planning. Um, EPA gets concerned about quantity of water really only as it relates to water quality, and then they, they have some um, concerns there. But in general, there is no federal law which um, even oversees water quantity issues. So states are, are very much um, usually on their own, which is why um, states end up you know, suing each other over water resources and having to go to court because there's no federal overlying jurisdiction to, um, to control it. 
what agency will be responsible for keeping data and where will it be available? Well, the, the data that goes into the model uh, is already, you know, in sort of different places. And we've talked about one of the benefits of this model of, of bringing it all together. So the models um, will be stored probably on the cloud. We'll have, you know, secure versions kept away in a vault, I'm sure. But, uh, you know, you can have these versions on the cloud for everybody to use and, and be available. Um, but all the different data sets, um, you know, or would, would um, already even be available. So, for example, the withdrawals and discharges and that sort of thing. So it really depends on which piece of data you, if you're interested in a very specific piece, uh, you can go to, um, you can come to us with that request. Okay, David, you can just hold on to the microphone because you'll be answering this one too. Uh, typically, models are used as simulation tools. Does DHEC anticipate using this model for surface water withdrawal as a definitive tool or as a reference tool? Well, I think more as a reference tool. The, the, the law is still the law, so um, we have to follow the law when we issue uh, permits. Uh, so. This tool, though, will help us evaluate the permit conditions and um, in a much more, um, I think, robust way and in a much easier way because right now we essentially do these uh, calculations uh, by hand. And so we can certainly use the model uh, to help us evaluate permit applications, but we still uh, will follow the criteria in the law. Okay, I think this next question was partially answered earlier, but we'll go we'll go with it and see where we end up. How are impacts in North Carolina handled that may impact future unimpaired flows? And was data collected in North Carolina also? We we haven't collected data in North Carolina specifically in the same way we're doing it. In South Carolina, where we're collecting all the flow records and the usage records over time, uh, but we will run the OASIS model for the Broad River, and as I said earlier, uh, import into our process two sets of flows, both the unimpaired flows from North Carolina at the state line, which is the boundary condition for the South Carolina model, and the impaired flows, uh, so that any user can decide uh, which flows to base a particular simulation on. Is it sort of an idealized, naturalized flow condition for the entire basin, or is it uh, the water that you can expect to have uh, under your jurisdiction here in South Carolina? So we'll collect those data sets from North Carolina, but not necessarily all the data that went into co to creating those. I'll add to that. Part of the question, I think, referred to future unimpaired flows. Um, and I know DNR is interested in, in updating, maybe on a five-year period, um, the unimpaired flows. Uh, so part of what we're trying to do is uh, make sure the methodology is clear uh, so that when they go to the, uh, update the unimpaired flows, they can get the, the, get the data and, and do the kind of same uh, manipulations on it and use the same methodology uh, to be consistent and update unimpaired flows in the future, perhaps at five-year intervals. Yeah, and I might add to that that um, you do, we do work with our other state partners. Um, for example, in North Carolina, has been very... Uh, good about providing us their data. We've already talked with the folks in Georgia so that when we get to the Savannah, uh, you know, they've already done a model in the Savannah Basin and have done unimpaired flows. So we anticipate uh, being able to, you know, share data. We already do share data. So. Okay. How are the basin plans going to be connected once completed? And will the plans be connected to economic development that crosses the basins for example, three basins along I-85. Well, that'll certainly be taken into account, and that's really going to be part of the stakeholder involvement process. Uh, the Basin Advisory Councils will probably be considering that, but when we pull it all together, uh, yes, uh, economics are, are part of the equation. Uh, you know, conservation measures, innovative practices, that kind of thing. Um, but, uh, you know, looking at economic impact is not really the primary purpose of statewide water planning. It's to ensure availability. Uh, so it'll be considered, but it's not the primary purpose. Will the groundwater modeling begin in 2015, and how is it being funded? 
we believe it will begin in 2015. It may be late in 2015. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're in discussions with USGS, and we already have some funding available, but not uh, enough funding to complete the model. So we'll have, for instance, in this year's legislative session, we will have a budget request for the groundwater modeling. Um, assuming that goes well, and I anticipate it will, and having discussions with key senators and representatives, uh, they understand the importance there. So. Uh, uh, the funding will come from the state, and we will have to match, uh, you know, what the USGS puts into it. Some of it may be some in-kind services from our hydrology staff. Okay, and as a follow-up to that, and this is the last index card question, and this one even says thanks at the end, so that's very nice. Um, of the five-step process, how many steps are currently funded, and where will funding come from for future steps? Well, the, uh, the first step is fully funded, uh, and like I said, we have a little bit of funding for the groundwater process. Uh, you know, when you look out five years, there's a lot of meetings and a lot of work that goes into it, so do we have all the funding in place? No, but as I said just a minute ago, uh, the legislature, this is on their radar screen, and I would be very surprised if they don't come forward with some funding.